I'd like to welcome David on stage who came from, from Boston. Um, he's really one of the major VCs in Boston from, from flagship. Uh, has a really impressive um, experience before turning 40, like you already 200 patents. He founded over two, uh, 20 companies, including Sirius, uh, Joule, um, Eleven, and, and many others. Um, so I thought you would be a really great speaker to talk about how far has biotech come. And I'll let you go for that. Please, a round of applause for David. Well, thank you, and thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, after you embarrassed me, I have to embarrass you. Uh, the last time I shared a stage with someone with a wonderful French accent who uh, carried his microphone right on his chin, well, he became president of France. So <laughs> I, I don't know what happens in the next election, but uh, when are you announcing? Uh, so I. I I'll give a little bit of a perspective, but uh, I was asked to give a, a, a commentary on how far we've come in biotech. And it's, it's always an interesting question and an interesting conversation because when you look at biotech, even though the term was really coined in the early 1900s, it's been given or attributed credit going back thousands if not tens of thousands of years to brewing tea, to making beer, to all sorts of really exciting things. And the interesting thing, of course, is, well, today we still make tea. Today we still make beer. Our flavors may get better. Uh, but when we look back in history, the biggest innovation in beer came around the 1860s um, of really trying to systematize the process. And that's kind of what unearthed a big set of innovations that ultimately led to biotechnology. And of course, biotechnology in its earliest days was focused on chemicals and fo focused on food. But the transformations that we tend to think about stem from the mid-1900s when we think about the innovations Francis, and Crick, uh, Francis Crick and uh, James Watson discovering basically the structure of DNA, uh, thinking about uh, Boyer and the production of insulin for the first time. And that's where we started having our uh, first true catalytic type innovations. And when we think about it, we can talk about the greatness of what happened at that time, of course. Uh, production of insulin, that led to the foundation of Genentech. And Genentech is the greatest company in the history of biotech. Well, it's interesting. If we take a step back and we ask that question. So there was a protein that was made, uh, which was a great feat at the time. There isn't a question about that. Genentech got started with a very big ambition and some wonderful cultural aspirations and some interesting ideas that even to this day have been carried forward, but also a carefree attitude that allowed them to to expand, but as the world around Genentech and some of its other uh, fellow innovators into biotech was actually getting started, it was met with a bunch of disbelief and a bunch of distrust. And when you look at the history, of course, we, all, we go back and we find that, of course, uh, that first product, insulin, was licensed very, very, on, very early on uh, to Lilly and, of course, became Humulin. Very important product. Saves many, many lives. Uh, how many you want to attribute to it today? Well, we can always put question marks, but it's a hugely important product and has transformed the lives of type, type 1 diabetics around the world. There isn't a question about that. But what was interesting was all of a sudden, Genentech got hubris. And they decided at that point, they didn't want to partner anymore. They wanted to keep all of their products on their own. And it's an interesting idea, but when you think about it, I mean, granted, today we have a better sense of the number of genes and the number of proteins that they had at the time, but assume it wasn't even 1,000. Let's assume it was only 50, right? At that time, there was one biotech product that was really made, because uh, insulin got approved in 1983. There was only one product that was made. How can a company imagine that it's going to be able to produce 50 products, 100 products, 500 products? But what they did, again, they stopped partnership. They filed aggressively in patents. And the ironic thing of what happened is while well, they created a ridiculous amount of value and they created uh, the, some of the core foundation of the biotech industry, what they also did was they inspired a tremendous amount of competition that allowed the biotech industry to launch. And in this regard, while well, they had filed a set of patents, because they stopped partnering, you saw companies like Lilly, you saw other startups 
trying to figure out ways that they could get around the innovations that Genentech had. And this was perhaps one of the greatest moments in the early portion of biotech, not for Genentech, probably the worst one for Genentech, but the best for the industry because it got the industry going. Now, roll the clock forward, because as, we, as that started a foundation, we had the benefit of products, we had the benefit, of course, of Amgen and Biogen and Genzyme pushing on different, uh, different areas at the time, but roll the clock forward, and you get into an interesting area where we started getting a little bit over the tips of our skis. You get into the genomics era. Now, on one hand, you look at companies like Solera uh, and Human Genome Sciences uh, and Millennium, and to this day, um, I don't think they've developed a therapeutic internally as of yet. Um, we won't comment too much on that. So again, getting a little bit ahead of their, over the tips of their skis. Interestingly, uh, in that era, in the genomics era, um, if you want to look towards products, you can actually go to the European companies. The American companies were all about hype. The European companies were all about products. So uh, I guess that was an era where maybe a better, better time to pick markets, pick stocks in America, but uh, to help people, you wanted to go to Europe. Um, but as you're progressing forward, uh, what we started to see is when you think about the levels of innovation that we've had, they're very significant innovations, which is we've been able to make recombinant proteins. We've been able to sequence DNA. And as we've moved forward, of course, we talk about the cost curve of sequencing coming down to the point that sequencing thousands, if tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of genomes is something we talk about very readily. And of course, at the same time, we talk about synthesizing DNA. We talk about making multiple proteins. But what is the state of the art that big biotech, that pharma is practicing today? Well, it's making single proteins. It's making engineered proteins. It hasn't advanced an exceptional amount. Of course, number of products that have produ been produced. Very exciting, it's been great for patients. We've moved forward in rare genetic diseases. People's lives with Gauchets, with Fabry's, with Pompeys have been transformed for forever. So don't get me wrong, a tremendous amount of success. But the core technology of biotech is kind of at its infancy. And this is actually one of the most exciting things to me. When you look out around the biotech world today, I think we're facing the opportunity of the first big inflection point since the foundation of Genentech. And this, to me, makes this perhaps the most exciting era in the history of biotech. Now, why do I say that? Well, one, of course, cost of sequencing has come tremendously far down. This allows us to get unprecedented amounts of information. The cost of synthesis has gone of DNA synthesis has gone tremendously down. We can make artificial constructs. We can understand what a gene might do. We can understand what networks do. We can do it by making it. We can also understand, interestingly, what we don't understand. I got asked by someone uh, late last week, uh, what do I think about synthesizing the human genome? In, it's an interesting concept because the first thing that comes to someone's mind is the fear of, oh my God, am I gonna take an E. coli and make it into an artificial human? Which, that's an interesting thought in its own right. But, you know, it's a, it's a tremendous act of hubris to believe that sim simply putting all of those DNA, all of the base pairs, is enough to make a human. It shows exactly how much we don't know. And the interesting thing is, we're just understanding this. There's new models, for example, that have been published within, within the last year by Rick Young and Rudolf Janisch about how the structure of DNA, the three-dimensional structure of DNA, is essential to its regulation. If we're just now understanding the regulation of DNA, that gives us entire new tools for therapeutics, for biologics. We're at the tip of the ability to edit the genome with the emergence of CRISPR-Cas9, and when, we, when you talk to the founders of this field, they'll tell you, it's also just at the beginning. So as we go from Cas9 to CPF1 to CasX to CasY, our ability to do things that allow us to influence the genome is going to unleash an entire new era of biotech. When we think about cell therapies, of course, this has been an idea that's been around for 20 years. But we're getting to the point where some of the first ones are really being pushed towards theoretical approval as we look at uh, what Novartis has been doing, what Kite has been doing, what Juno has been doing. And these are minimally engineered. When we think about the capabilities of synthetic biology, when we think beyond the T cell to perhaps the most innocuous cell in the body, the red blood cell, when we think about what it might mean to make a therapy out of an epithelial cell, this is an era that we haven't even started. 
So from this perspective, as we continue to push forward, we're only, in my mind, at the beginning. Further, as we start thinking about it, when I went through medical school, we were told de facto what the body looked like. We were told that, the, that every organ in the body was understood, every connection was understood. Last organ that was discovered was in 1860 called the parathyroid. And of course, many in the room already know that there's another organ that we're just now discovering called the microbiome. And this organ is tremendously important because of course we know that rats, mice that don't have a microbiome don't really live all that well. Uh, we all, we're, we've been learning that if your micro, my, microbiome goes awry, you can develop important diseases from infection to ulcerative colitis to potentially autism to potentially Parkinson's. We don't even know it, but when we don't know that there's an organ there just because it looks different, that means we barely understand the basis of the biology that we're trying to treat. So, and that's unleashed a very, very fast growing field. And perhaps one of the most interesting ones is, of course, at the core of all of this is the nucleic acids themselves. This has been a field that's been stymieing biotech for decades. We can, we can look back uh, at companies like Isis, or I'm not supposed to say that anymore, Ionis um, and Alnylam, uh, and you know, while Ionis has been able to translate into products, Alnylam still, still hasn't. Uh, but with companies like Moderna developing that are now putting 10, 20 different products into the clinic in very short periods of time, we're getting to the era where theoretically DNA, RNA-based therapeutics are really gonna become something that's interesting. Again, it's the same thing in gene therapy. The first era didn't work out well. This era, we're starting to get some pretty interesting opportunities. And these are with the basic elements of genes. When we start incorporating capabilities around, um, sorry, it's my, in my, my opinion, it's the worst named area of bio, synthetic, bio, uh, synthetic biology. Uh, as, a, as a bit of an aside, whoever the marketing genius was that invented this field and put the word synthetic and biology together and thought it was a way to sell a field, uh, I hope they've been fired. Um, but as we start putting the capabilities of that field, whatever we want to call it right now, um, into things like gene therapy, we're going to start getting tremendous benefits. So I, it brings me back to the common point of, I actually see us as almost at the birth point of the future of biotechnology, which is allowing us to start thinking about what are the products? What are the capabilities we can start achieving? What are the organs we don't know? What are the pieces of DNA regulation that we don't know? What are the ways that we can intervene in the biology, that, in the biology of humans that are only now emerging? And even worse, I'm only talking about the human side, the agriculture side, of course, as, as many of us know, has been stymied because of regulations around, uh, around, around GMOs. This is perhaps an even more exciting field. Uh, one of the things that is available now, uh, and I probably shouldn't say this too loud because someone might catch on to what, I'm a, what, I'm, what the implications of this are, in the way that genetic modification is defined, you need 20 consecutive base pairs to be changed in order for something to be considered genetic modification. That's the European definition. In the US, it's even laxer. With CRISPR, it's very easy to change an entire genome only changing 19 base pairs in a row at a time. So for ha perhaps we're actually at a point where we can start thinking about what biotech might be able to do. Am I saying it's a good thing? I don't have a position on it. I don't think we actually know. I don't think the studies have actually been done to figure out whether GM agriculture is a good thing or not, but I sure know that with, the, uh, with population projections that are looking at 10 billion at 2050, and if we don't meet that 1 billion by uh, 2100, uh, but if we do, potentially more growth in, in humanity, uh, huge opportunities to be thinking about agriculture and, and whatnot. So as we're looking at it, again, I think we're at the earliest stages of, of biotech. I think it's not just human health. I think it's agriculture. Uh, we're starting to see eras that are enabled by this synthetic biology field that go into sustainability. We've gone through the first era of that with some degree of success. That's starting to advance again from energy to chemicals to in, in some corners of the earth even mining. Um, and where, where I look at this is, this is the right time to be a biotech innovator, this is the right time to be a biotech investor, um, and I think at the end of the day, the real question is, where biotech is going? Well, that's frankly up to all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.
on this one here. Well, amazing, David. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess I a few questions, and then I will take some questions from, from all of you as well. Um, I guess one, one thing about what you said about, uh, I, I want to dig a bit deeper into mRNA, your microbiome, or CRISPR. As I think, I mean, flagship, you invested in all of them, and as pioneering, like, it's in your name, I guess, yeah. Uh, it's one of the things. So maybe we could start, like, with, uh, I mean, let, let's start with, like, microbiome. Um, like, how, wh what's your vision more in, in, in more details, like, on let's say, the clinical trials on what we really know, what we still don't know, I mean, besides that we just discovered the organ, and like, what's the real potential? It, sure, so I think we're still early days in the microbiome. Uh, we've made five, depending on how you want to count it, investments across the microbiome. Uh, first one was a company called Sirius Therapeutics, which is this recognition that the microbiome is an organ. And in this case, Effectively, you can think about it as we're figuring out ways to do organ transplants. Um, in, in that case, you can think of it, unlike the kidney where you need a full kidney to do an organ transplant, it's more like the liver, where you can fin figure out the minimum component. And said simply, that's kind of what Ceres has been doing. And clinical trials aside, um, the results have been actually quite successful. Um, but we've also pushed into a new era where it's not about the organ, it's about the individual organisms, because there's a rare set of organisms, very rare in fact, that have dramatic potential to override systems. And this is at the core of companies like Avello uh, and in the agriculture world, Indigo, where adding single organisms can upregulate the immune system, downregulate the immune system, induce water stress, heat stress, et cetera, type gains on a tremendous level. And this is based on privilege. But again, we're just understanding the cues of this. So the trials are actually pretty straightforward. They're the trials you would do for anything else. <clears throat> the manufacturing is the part that's new. Yeah. And that's the rules that we're inventing as we go. And good news is the FDA and the EPA are very willing to work with folks because they recognize that there's a lot of potential. And when will these are the first product on the market, you think? When will be the first microbiome product in the market? That's up to the FDA. Yeah. No, um, <laughs> actually, to be honest, the first microbiome product, even from our portfolio, is already on the market. Okay. So Indigo released its uh, first cotton product er earlier this year uh, to farmers, uh, and it's been growing very, very quickly in the market. Now, on the therapeutic side, yeah. um, of course, Ceres has announced that uh, it's, it's entering into a potentially pivotal trial. Um, and Again, depending on the, on the data, we could see something and we could see something in the 20, 20 ish t uh, type time period. That's great. And, and about, I guess you mentioned CRISPR Cas9 or CRISPR CPA4 and all of, all of these ones. Um, I guess you, invest, you invested in, in Editas um, and it's going well uh, so far. Um, so, how, what, what's, your, like, what's your vision on Editas slash the impact of, of CRISPR? Like, so uh, the, whole, the whole gene editing field is a very interesting one uh, where I think it's a field that's sort of inventing itself as it goes and no one really understands what to think of it. Um, Editas has been focused on building a lot of the tools that are going to enable uh, what's going to get there. But a, a testament to the fact that no one understands this, probably many in the audience saw this paper from last week that came out uh, from Nature, which I still don't know how it got into Nature. Uh, where they showed that it turns out siblings apparently have a similar genome, uh, and that genome is different than uh, unrelated organ, uh, an unrelated animal, um, and that if you put CRISPR in there, the genomes are still different. Um, that's my interpretation of the data. So literally what they did was they added Cas9 to a control, a, a control animal, and then two siblings, um, and they showed that there were a number of single nucleotide variances in the uh, siblings that were highly consistent and unlike the control animal, and they said, ah, CRISPR has off-target effects. Well, you didn't actually do your control. Um, <laughs> somehow published by Nature, so I guess Nature is the fake news of... Uh, uh, fake news biotech. of biotech. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the point of that, though, is, well, that, I mean, to me, it's a horrible study. No offense if you guys in the audience are the ones who did it. Um, Actually, maybe I do mean offense, but whatever. Um, if someone writing for Nature yeah. Biotech. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm okay with that, too. Um, but 
it, what it points to is the fact that we're super early in the field and people don't know how to think about it. Um, it's a really powerful technology. We're just at the beginning. We're just thinking about creating sort of small variances in DNA. Um, the question's gonna become when it gets more interesting that we start getting into larger pieces, when we start getting into CRISPR-A, um, CRISPR-I, you know, upregulating, downregulating expression. And then the next era is gonna be epigenetic editing, where we can almost use the body as its own therapeutic. Um, so I think we're, again, we're still early days. Our strategy with Editas has been think big, think broad, think about how you can get there quickly, what can you do uniquely. Of course, that's why they started in the eye, uh, but the opportunity is around the whole body. And, and if it's so early, I mean, is it not like, as you just said, US is about hype and Europe is about product, is it not like kind of making, over, I mean, overhyping the, the CRISPR companies and getting to like a billion valuation without being a human? Like, is it, is it the main reason why you don't have <laughs> CRISPR companies in Europe? <laughs> Perhaps there's gonna be CRISPR companies in five, 10 years when we start getting to the point of making products. No, um, <laughs> so, I think CRISPR was one of these things, when you, when you actually look back at the history, so we actually started working on CRISPR in our venture labs about two years before Editas got started. Um, and the interesting story that goes into this was we had uh, Fung and David Liu and Keith Zhang uh, and Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier all working together on one company. And then Fung did something that's gone down in sort of biotech lore and we won't get into the details. Uh, and that caused a little bit of a rift. So what was interesting is all of CRISPR could have been consolidated into a single company that but for a set of actions, um, ultimately led it into a, a range of companies. Because the, com the, because the potential of CRISPR really is so large, it was one of those fields that didn't need hype generated, it had hype generated for it. It's something where people are talking about rapid Nobel Prizes, they're talking about this being perhaps the most important discovery since PCR, and when that's the conversation, not from us, then you know that this is gonna be an area that's hyped. The challenge with that is if you get caught up in your own, uh, if you're in your own hype cycle, then you forget about making products. And I think one of the things Editas has done really well is keeping head down, keeping nose to the grindstone, and saying what are the things that we really need to do in order to make this successful. And I think, you know, if you look at um, where, where this is gonna be going, uh, obviously people are thinking about the nits and the next generations, and um, this one to me is not a US versus, uh, versus Europe opportunity, but uh, the, the European version of this, if you will, if you use my example from the past, yeah. uh, is the version that is gonna be very product oriented, and I think we're gonna start seeing that emerge sooner than we all expect. Great, and, and talking about all these, these um, um, I, I would like, you, you talked about Genentech, the best company. And, and so what do you see right now in these, like within these companies and these like pioneering fields, which one for you has the biggest potential to be the next Genentech then? Not only flagship portfolio companies. There's other companies? <laughs> you know, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I like to be a bit of a student of biotech and, and the company to me that's best positioned, it is a flagship company, is Moderna. Uh, part of the reason for this is we did look very carefully back at what companies like Genentech did right, what they did wrong, what Amgen did right, what it did wrong, and just look through the history. And this has actually helped create a model for Moderna because based on what we know about the genome, if you theoretically have the potential to make mRNA therapeutics for any gene, then you could do it across the genome. There are too many targets for Moderna to develop, period. Now, we recognize that. That's why they launched 100 clinical trials. Huh? So that's why they launched their I mean, clinical launch trials. It. They picked some that they can do on their own, but they did a, a 40 deal, a, a 40 product deal with AstraZeneca, a 10 product deal with Alexion, a multi-product deal with, uh, with Merck. And if you think about it, the business model that they're developing is become the main producer of mRNA for the industry, recognizing that they'll make some drugs, but they're, they're gonna do way better if they enable the entire of the industry. And ironically, that's gonna reduce other people from needing to do it because they're enabling the entirety of the industry. So I think that's, that's perhaps one of the most exciting. Um, there's companies that, to me that are also very well poised to be incredibly exciting. Companies like Rubius uh, that's developing red cell therapeutics. Um, and the reason these are so exciting is they're pushing the frontiers of how we think about things like cell therapy into opportunities that can get into almost every uh, therapeutic area. So I, I look at these as seeing a number of opportunities that can be very exciting. 
and and you just talked about how you founded Moderna. I think we can we can talk a bit about flagships model because it's it's. I mean, you you have a few others in 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 US like Third Work or, or Atlas who have a similar approach, but in Europe it's it's quite wow to like really start companies from the from the ground. Um, how do you like? What's what's your view on on this on your on your like strategy to start companies on the ground? Why you're doing it? And then how do you really systematize that and like optimize the process? Yeah, so we have a bit of a different model than others. Um, at the 80,000 foot view, it all looks the same because we're all starting companies, it's fine. Um, but when you look at it, you know, Atlas basically looks at more single product type companies. They're looking for asset oriented approaches. There's nothing wrong with it, it's just different. Uh, Third Rock likes getting groups of, groups of professors together to come up with ideas. For us, it's actually our coming up with our own ideas. And we have a team of about 30 people that through a dedicated process basically starts by asking questions, forms hypotheses. We do engage with the community, but we do it in a different way where we take advantage of the world's uh, second most renewable resource, the first being the sun, uh, the second being people's willingness to tell you how bad your ideas are. Um, and this is great because what it does is it creates almost sort of a lean startup-like forcing function that before we get into the lab helps us iterate our ideas. And that very quickly helps us hone in on hypotheses. We spend half a million, a million dollars validating things, and only then do we actually make an investment if we fail basically to kill it in the early days. The other thing that we've been doing, and this has been something we've been improving since about 2007, is we don't syndicate the deals we do internally. So we'll put the first 30 odd million dollars without a penny from someone else. And the reason for that is there's cycles in the, vent in the venture industry. Uh, there's usually up to 18 months where everyone's really excited in biotech. We went through that between 2013 and 2015. It happens every seven years. Last was 07, before that was, 19, was 99, 2000, before that was 92 to 94. It's, it's literally every seven years. So we got a little while to wait for the next big bubble in biotech, but whatever, this is the right time to start a big company because it'll bubble up by then. Um, but um, when, when, when we're not in those periods, a lot of venture capitalists get nervous and they want to have the smallest opportunity and the smallest exposure. And the problem is when, you, when you're doing science, you don't know what you know. And you don't know what you don't know. And there's always this phase in the first six to 12 months where you do an experiment and you get the, huh, that's funny result. It's probably the most important thing that happens in the history of companies because that tells you what you really have. And we find that when we've syndicated, that's the moment of fear in syndicates that causes panic and uh, companies to go sideways and questions whether we should stop funding it, uh, except if you're in a single asset. Uh, and, but in platform companies, that's the opportunity for us to double down. Yeah. And so that's why we stopped syndicating, so that we could allow these companies to explore that. And that's why you raised the, the last fund of $600 million, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> I guess more than and it at least doubled in any fund in any well. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, go for it. You have a, can you bring a mic? in the front? Um, is it natural that syndicated backers are going to be more conservative, do you think? Based on what you just said, in fact. So it's not that the individual backers necessarily have to be, but the nature of syndicates is they're as strong as the weakest participant. So if one investor is going through a cycle where they can't raise a new fund, then you can get a whole company that's recapitalized just because of that. So again, it's not the individuals, it's the group nature of it. So the process of syndication is faulty in a way because people are not aligned. Agreed. Hi. Question in the back there. Hi, David, thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. Yeah, your enthusiasm is infectious. I'd just thank like you. to push you a little bit on the microbiome, uh, if I may. The field really very much is in its infancy, as you've suggested. And we've got lots of companies racing to that first approved product, ranging from small molecules to consortiums. What do you think is the best approach or the one most likely to be the biggest success across that spectrum of approaches and why? I don't think there's a single answer to that, to be fully honest. Um, we started in consortia because the data that we were able to generate and see told us a path to get there. We have other companies on single organisms. We have other companies on small molecules. Um, so from that perspective, we've put bets in all of it, not to diversify, but because each of them offers a unique handle on a biology. And the key thing in my mind is that 
one has to recognize that each of those areas does not do all of the microbiome. Each of those areas has something that it does particularly well. So if you think about um, the consortia, that's going after the organ nature of the microbiome. If you think about individual organisms, it's going after the organ system. Uh, think about musculoskeletal, right? The muscle is not very useful without bones. It's sort of twitchy fibers. Bones aren't that useful with mus without muscles. They don't really move. They just hang in front of a classroom. Um, and in the same way, the microbiome doesn't elicit its function without the immune system. But that means that the single organism tends to have benefits in the immune system in particular. Um, and then the secreted factors, well, what, is, what do secreted factors do? They act on epithelial cells, they act on the immune system, so they're gonna have particular activities that they're gonna be able to achieve. So again, keeping, keeping with the pharmacology, keeping with the biology is the best way to get effects. Just time for one small one. Can bring a mic in the middle? Yeah. Just a quick one, then we have to... I don't know whether it's a quick one, Holger, from Fovian Capital Partners. I have more question related to society. Your talk remembered me in the 80s where in Germany we had the insulin production idea in Frankfurt Hoest, which was completely pushed back by political forces and, you know, critics in the society about G technology. Now CRISPR is in the news and even the normal, you know, newspaper talk about the opportunity and challenges of CRISPR. What do you think given your talk and your ideas, what we need to do as biotechnology environment or scene to take along the normal people, also with regard to the green agriculture technology? So it's a great question, and it's something I've, I've actually been quite, quite personally passionate about. Um, I've been, for separate purposes, involved with uh, a group at the United Nations and thinking about some of these issues. And, and the biggest challenge is, in a way, the way that biotechnology has been presented and talked about to the public is almost in as scary a way as possible. So the natural reaction is fear. What can go wrong with CRISPR? What can go wrong with GM? And sure, there are things that can go wrong. But with that, we, we stop focusing on the questions of what is it that we need to understand? And what's, what's been missing this goes back to the GM questions in agriculture, it's there today with synthetic biology, it's there today with CRISPR, is it's almost the question of what would the world want to have seen to understand that this might be safe or not? And one of the things that I think biology, biotech, uh, and they did this a little bit in the early, um, in the early eras of biotech with some of the tribunals at Harvard, if I can call them that, uh, is, is start asking the questions of what's necessary to show that it's safe. I think that's what we actually have to focus on, and I think it's incumbent on us on, as a community to figure out how do we figure that out, how do we answer that. I think if we can start answering that and include the public, include the scientists, include governments, and but get answers to that, then we'll have a path by which we can say, hey, we're operating above board, we're operating in a bounds where we care about society, and we're operating in a way where the clear opportunity here goes back to the foundation and the invention of the word biotechnology, which in its core definition includes benefit for social good. If we're focused on that, I think we can be successful, but I think that's been a little bit forgotten. Great. Time's up, sorry. Um, great, thank you, Dave.